Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the awesome privilege of gathering together to open your word. What an awesome word it is. It reveals the end from the beginning and how we can prepare for the closing events in the history of this world. We ask that as we study today about how to choose the right church that your Holy Spirit will guide our thoughts. And we thank you for hearing our prayer for we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. I have the privilege of traveling quite a bit not only within the United States but also to other countries of the world. And I find it very interesting that uh, people choose all different kinds of reasons why they want to choose a particular church to attend. I'd like to share with you as we begin our study today some of the reasons that people have given me in my travels for their belonging to a certain church. Some say, well, my friends attend this certain church and that's the reason why I go there. Other individuals say, well, my family has belonged to this church for generations and why change a good thing? Still others say, I attend such and such a church because it has the most members. Others say, I choose to go to this church because it has upbeat worship services, or it has wonderful programs, or it has plenty of felt needs seminars. Others say, I attend this church because of the location and because of the wonderful physical plant that the church has. Others say, I go to this church because it has the most charismatic and wonderful preacher on planet earth. Still others look at the church as a social club. They say, well, you know, my social life is excellent at church, and that's the reason why I go to this specific church. My question is, are these really the true criteria which should lead us in choosing which church we should belong to? I believe that all of these things are important. But I believe that there's something which is far more important than any one of these uh, that I've mentioned or all of them put together. And that is we should choose the church that God specifies in Scripture as being the church which is in harmony with His truth as it is presented in Holy Scripture. And so in our study today we're going to examine the biblical characteristics of the true church. And we're going to allow the Bible to tell us if in this world there is a true church and whether we can actually find it. Now we're going to follow a very carefully uh, reasoned presentation. We're going to follow step by step you remember that I mentioned in a previous le lecture the principle of historicism. Prophecy begins fulfilling in the days when the prophet wrote and it continues fulfilling without interruption till the close of time. That is going to be the method that we will use for identifying the true church in our study today. We're going to begin our study in Revelation chapter 12 and we're going to move through this chapter and notice the different stages that we find uh, here in this wonderful symbolic chapter of Holy Scripture. Revelation chapter 12 and I want to read verse 1. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland or a crown of twelve stars. Now I want to dwell on two particular symbols in this verse. Symbol number one, the woman. And symbol number two, the twelve stars that she has on her crown or on her garland. Now we need to ask the question, what is represented by the woman in this verse? Well, let's go to the book of Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2. Here God is speaking about His church in the Old Testament. He's speaking about Israel. And it says here, God speaking, I have likened the daughter of Zion, that is Israel, in other words, 
to a lovely and delicate woman. To what does God compare His Old Testament church? To a beautiful and delicate woman. In other words, a woman represents the church. Now immediately we ask the question, in Revelation chapter 12, is this speaking about the Old Testament church or is it speaking about the New Testament church? The answer is simple. It's referring to the Old Testament church. And you say, how do we know that? Well, the fact is that when John sees this woman in Revelation 12, she has not had the child yet. The child is still in her womb. And she's crying out because she wants to have the child. This represents the fact that Israel was clamoring for the Messiah. They were clamoring for the Deliverer to be born. In other words, the fact that the woman still has the child in her womb when John sees her indicates that this woman represents the Old Testament church. Now let's pursue another avenue to nail down this point. Go with me to Genesis chapter 49 and verse 28. Why a crown of 12 stars? This will help us identify this woman. Genesis chapter 49 and verse 28. Here we find a, a reference to the 12 sons of Jacob. And I want you to notice what we find in this verse that helps us identify very clearly this woman as the Old Testament church. Genesis 49 and verse 28. It says this. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob, are the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is what their father spoke to them and he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. So notice that we have the twelve sons of Jacob which become the twelve what? The twelve tribes of Israel. Incidentally, it's no coincidence that in Genesis 37 and verse 9, we're not going to read it, but in Genesis 37 and verse 9, Joseph makes reference to a dream that he had. And he said that he saw the sun, the moon, and eleven stars bowing to him. And of course that's referring to what would happen later in Egypt. Notice that his brothers are compared to what? To stars, according to Joseph. And so the twelve stars represent the twelve tribes of Israel, which constitutes the Old Testament church. Are you with me? Now, this woman not only represents the Old Testament church, but we're going to notice that it also represents the New Testament church. You see, God has only one people throughout the course of all of history. He doesn't have an Old Testament church and a New Testament church, technically speaking. He actually has one true church that begins at the very start of human history with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and ends at the very end of time with the faithful remnant of God. I want you to notice that Jesus chose, according to the Bible, 12 apostles to be the nucleus of the Christian church. And so you have 12 sons of Jacob, which formed the tribes of Israel. You have the 12 apostles of Jesus, which formed the nucleus of the Christian church. Now I must underline, once again, that the woman that is seen in Revelation 12 and verse 1, at this stage in verse 1, represents the Old Testament church, because she has not had the child. Later on though, this woman has to flee into the wilderness. And this is referring to the New Testament church. But I want you to notice that it's the same woman, the number 12 identifies both the Old and the New Testament church. In case someone says, well, the number 12 isn't really that important, Jesus chose 12 apostles by coincidence. I want to go to the book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse 16. Acts chapter 1 and verse 16. When Judas Iscariot fell by the wayside, we find very clearly that the disciples felt that they needed to have 12. There was something special about the number 12. Notice Acts chapter 1 and verse 16. Here Peter is speaking. He says, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the, by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. And then I want you to notice that as the story continues, they say, 
we need to name a successor to Judas. There need to be 12 apostles because 12 is the kingdom number. It's the number of the church of God in the Old and in the New Testament. And so they cast lots and Matthias is actually elected as the successor of Judas. In other words, he took Judas's place. It's no coincidence also that according to the book of Revelation, in Revelation 21 and verse 12, we are told that the gates of the holy city have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the foundations of the city have the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Do you notice that there is only one city that includes the saints from the Old Testament and the saints from the New Testament? There's only one woman. The number 12 represents the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the Lamb. One church from the beginning of history till the end of time. One true church. And so in Revelation chapter 12 the chapter begins with this woman. She has a child in her womb and she's crying out to deliver this child. Now I want you to notice who this child is. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 identifies the child. By the way this is very closely connected with Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, now notice this, born of a what? Born of a woman, born under the law. Who is the seed that is born from the woman? It is Jesus Christ. Notice also Revelation chapter 12 and verse 2. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 2. It says there, Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So she has a child in her womb. Now let's go to verse 5 to identify this child. It says in verse 5, She bore a what? A male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to His throne. Who is this child? This male child, born of a woman, who later is caught up to God and to His throne. There's no doubt. It obviously is Jesus Christ. Now when Jesus Christ is born, now this woman transitions into the New Testament period. The same woman. There's not a woman that represents the Old Testament church and then another woman which represents the New Testament church. There is only one woman, one true church. It has different stages, yes. It has different periods, yes. But it is one church. And so the child is born. Now I want you to notice what happens when the child is born. Let's go once again to Revelation chapter 12 and let's read verse 3. Revelation 12 and verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. Notice we have a dragon. And what does this dragon want to do? Notice verse 4. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. To what? To devour her child as soon as as it was born. So what is the dragon trying to do? He's standing next to the woman to devour the child as soon as the child is born. Question, who is this dragon? Well, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7 identifies this dragon. It says there, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. And they did not prevail, that is the devil and his angels, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, or that ancient serpent, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Who is this dragon? The dragon is Satan, very clearly identified. But now I need to explain something. Even though in the primary sense the dragon represents Satan, in a secondary sense the dragon are the political or civil powers of the world that the devil uses to accomplish his purposes. 
I'll give you an example which I've mentioned in a previous lect lecture. Ezekiel chapter 29 and verse 3. We're not going to go there, but I'll just mention it. You have it in your list of texts. There in Ezekiel 29 and verse 3, in the King James Version, it calls Pharaoh the great dragon. Interesting that a civil ruler would be called the great dragon. Now, when Jesus was born, we're told in Revelation 12 that the great dragon stood next to the, to the woman to devour the child as soon as the child was born. Did the devil stand personally next to the woman to destroy Jesus when he was born? No. How did the devil try to accomplish it? Go with me to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16. Here we find the way the devil works. The devil works in the background. He uses uh, political powers of the world. He uses civil powers of the world. Now notice, Revela uh, not Revelation, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16. It says here, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. So who was the one who actually did the dirty work, so to speak? It was Herod. And Herod was a ruler of which empire? He was a ruler of the Roman Empire. So in another sense, the dragon represents what? The dragon represents Rome. Are you following me? The same fourth beast of, Revelation, of Daniel chapter 7. Remember? Uh, that beast that had teeth of iron and trampled and destroyed everything that he came in contact with. That's the same power we have here. Now let me ask you, how many horns did the dragon have in Daniel chapter 7? The dragon had ten horns. How many horns does this dragon have in Revelation chapter 12? We just read it in verse 3. It says that he had ten horns. Is the fourth kingdom of Daniel 7 the same dragon of Revelation chapter 12? Absolutely. And so notice, we've moved from the Old Testament church, the woman has the child, the child hasn't been born. And now we've moved to the moment which the child is born. And when the child is born, the dragon, the devil, through Herod, tries to destroy the child, but the child escapes from the power of Satan and he's caught up to God and to his throne. And then you notice that the dragon has what? The dragon has ten horns. Now if you read Revelation 12, you would never get the impression that the ten horns come up after the dragon has ruled for a period. You don't get that from the book of Revelation. That's why we need to compare Daniel and Revelation. We've studied this before. Do you remember that this dragon beast has three stages of existence? First of all, it governs as a dragon beast or a nondescript beast. Then in Daniel 7, 23 and 24, it says that, that from the head of this dragon beast come forth what? Ten horns. In other words, Rome is divided into what? Into ten kingdoms. And then among the ten horns rises what? A little horn which rules for time times and the dividing of time. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 12 and continue studying the sequence. You have the woman in the Old Testament, child not born. Then the child is born. Then comparing with Daniel, that dragon sprouts ten horns. Rome is divided into ten kingdoms. Now my question is, which would be the next stage that you would expect to come in Revelation chapter 12? It must be the same stage as the little horn. Right? And by the way, before we get to the little horn, allow me just to mention two passages. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5 speaks of the ascension of Jesus. Jesus ascended to heaven. And if you read John chapter 12 verses 31 to 33, Jesus says, Now is the judgment of the world, of this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. And he was talking about his death on the cross. And then when Jesus arrives in heaven, according to Revelation 12, verses 10 through 12, all heaven is singing, because the accuser of the brethren has been what? Has been cast out, who accused them day and night. And so you have the dragon, and you have the ten horns. You would expect the next period to be time, times, and dividing of time. If we're following the parallel sequence of Daniel 7. Now go with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6. 
Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6. This is immediately after the period of the dragon with ten horns. And you notice that in verse 6 it says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there one thousand two hundred and sixty days. What comes after the period of the dragon with the ten horns? The period when the woman flees to the wilderness for how long? One thousand two hundred and sixty days, which really are what? Years. Now Revelation 12, 13 through 15 amplifies this point. Notice what we find in verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, this was done at the cross, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. See, he went after the male child first. And when he wasn't successful, now he goes after the woman. Verse 14, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Is this the same period of the little horn of Daniel 7? Absolutely. It's expressed even in the same terms. Time, times, and dividing of time is the same as 1260 days or years. And so you've moved from the Old Testament to when the dragon rules and Rome, Satan through Rome, tries to kill the child, to Rome divided into ten kingdoms, and now to the period of the 1260 years, which by the way last from 538 according to what we've studied till the year 1798. Now let's go to Revelation 12 and examine verse 13 through 15 and then we'll read 16 which is very very important. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times, and half a time, from the presence of the serpent. Now notice, so the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. What do waters represent in Scripture? Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15 says, The waters upon which the woman sitteth are multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. In other words, the dragon used multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples to try and do away with the woman who had brought the male child into the world. But the Bible says that God gave the church, the woman, refuge in the wilderness. He was not able to destroy her. Who came to the rescue of the woman? Notice verse 16, very important. It says in verse 16 of chapter 12, But the earth helped the woman. In other words, when the, when the woman is being persecuted by the dragon, who is spewing his multitudes to try and drown the woman and destroy her, something comes to the rescue. Notice it's not another beast that comes to the rescue. It is the earth a territory if you please. And so it says the earth helped the woman and what did the earth do? The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth and as a result persecution what? Ceases because the earth swallowed up the waters of persecution and helped the woman. By the way this must have happened around the end of the 1260 years, right? because we're following a sequence. The little horn and the beast governed for 1260 years, which means that the earth helping the woman has to come towards the end of this period. Now I want you to notice Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Do you think the devil is happy about the earth helping the woman and swallowing up the waters of persecution? Obviously not. And so we have one final stage of warfare. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. Why would he be enraged with the woman? What does the previous verse say? The earth what? Helped the woman. And because the earth helped the woman, now the dragon is further enraged. And notice, and the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war. 
I like the way the King James says it, with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so Revelation chapter 12 comes to an end. We followed a sequence of events. Let's review that sequence of events. Chapter 12 of Revelation begins in the Old Testament before the child is born. Then it moves to the period of the dragon when the dragon tries to kill the child as soon as he's born. That dragon according to Daniel chapter 7 then sprouts ten horns, the ten divisions in Western Europe. Then the woman is persecuted into the wilderness for 1260 years, 538 to 1798. But towards the end of this period something known as the earth swallows up the waters of persecution and helps the woman. This angers and enrages the dragon and so he goes to make a final war against the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Do you see how this prophecy has moved from the Old Testament till the final persecution of God's people on planet earth without interruption? Now what are the commandments of God that are mentioned here as being kept by this remnant? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 17. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 17. Here Jesus is speaking to the rich young ruler and he uses the same terminology as we find in Revelation 12 and verse 17. Uh, actually Jesus says to the rich young ruler in uh, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 17, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God. But if you want to enter into life, what? Keep the commandments. The same expression. Keep the commandments. Now which commandments was Jesus speaking about? If you continue reading, the young man says which? Jesus says you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. Which commandments is Jesus quoting when he says keep the commandments? He's referring to the Ten Commandments. Which means that this final remnant on planet earth will keep what? Will keep the commandments of God. The nine commandments, all nine of them. Oh, thank you very much. They will keep all the commandments of God. The ten commandments. But notice also that they will have the testimony of Jesus. What is that testimony of Jesus? Which appears in the remnant after the year 1798. By the way, did you notice that this remnant has to appear when the earth helps the woman at the end of this period? Have you noticed that this remnant has to appear after 1798? And where do they have to appear? They have to appear where? On the earth. Because that's the place where the woman was helped. So you need to look for a people who appear on what is called the earth, you have to look for a people who arise shortly after the year 1798. You have to look for a people who teach that you're supposed to keep all of the commandments of God. And you have to search for a people who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now the question is, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Let's go and let Revelation itself explain it. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. John says this, and I fell at his feet to worship him, because an angel has appeared to him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. What do John's brethren have? The testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is what? Is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, the, the final remnant against whom the devil launches his final onslaught will keep the commandments of God, all of the commandments of God, and will have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. The reason why it's called the spirit of prophecy is because prophecy is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, they will have the gift of prophecy. Now do you remember in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 the two things that the little horn thought that he could change? Go back with me to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. 
Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 some of you weren't here on that previous presentation so we need to read this because it's very very important it says there in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 he shall speak pompous words against the Most High shall persecute the saints of the Most High shall intend or as the King James says shall think to change what? times and law we've already identified the times as God's prophetic sequence of events, God's prophetic calendar, the way in which he explains how prophecy will be fulfilled in the end times. We've already identified the law as the law of God as found in the Ten Commandments. Now are you seeing something interesting? The little horn thinks that he can change the law of God and he thinks that he can change God's prophetic calendar. Do you know how God counteracts that? He says, okay, I'm going to raise up a people who keep the commandments of God and who have the gift of prophecy. In other words, God raises up a people to undo what the little horn tries to do. A people who will exalt the Ten Commandments, including the one which the papacy tried to change, and which will have the gift of prophecy which shows the true way in which final events will develop in Bible prophecy. And by the way, if you're interested in knowing how this end time scenario is going to develop, you need to read the book The Great Controversy. You can pick up a complimentary copy as you go out uh, from the lecture today. It's a fabulous book. It's a book that was written by Ellen White. And if you read that book, particularly the last half of it, you say, wow, it's like she lived right now in these days. It's like she was seeing the news that you see on television today. Because things are, are developing just like she said. And by the way, this book was published in 1911. Almost 100 years ago and what she writes is simply amazing because God gave this gift to the remnant church to show how prophecy will truly develop not the way the little horn said that it would develop now we need to move on to Revelation chapter 13 because Revelation 13 is parallel to Revelation 12 go with me to Revelation chapter 13 and let's follow the sequence in this chapter Revelation 13 and we will begin at verse 1 then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and on his horns ten crowns and on his heads a blasphemous name now we could take time to explain every one of these symbols but it would take us far beyond the time period that we have here verse 2 is the critical verse now the beast which I saw was like a leopard his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. What chapter of the Bible does this make you think of? Daniel chapter what? 7. Do you have a lion in both chapters? Yes. Do you have a bear in both chapters? Yes. Do you have a leopard in both chapters? Yes. Do you have a dragon in both chapters? Does a dragon have ten horns in both chapters? Absolutely. So Revelation chapter 13 is following the same sequence as Revelation chapter 12. And by the way, Revelation 13 is beginning in the Old Testament, isn't it? Because Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece are Old Testament powers. The lion, the bear, and the leopard are Old Testament powers. And then you move to the dragon with ten horns, which is the same dragon with ten horns that tried to kill the male child when he was born. Are you following the sequence? Now let me ask you, which would you expect to be the next period in Revelation 13 if it's parallel to Revelation 12? You've seen the Old Testament, the dragon, the dragon has ten horns, and now the dragon gives his power to whom? To the beast. How long would you expect the beast to govern? How about 1260 days if we're following the same sequence? Yes? You think so? Absolutely. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5 and you'll see it. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5. It says here in verse 5, And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. Is that what the little horn did also? Absolutely. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Is that the same period as time times and the dividing of time? Absolutely. Is it the same time period as 1260 days or years? Absolutely. So is Revelation 13 running parallel to Revelation chapter 12? Absolutely. And parallel to Daniel 7. 
No doubt whatsoever. And now I want you to notice verse 7 of Revelation 13. Verse 7. It was granted him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. By the way, did you notice here that in, in uh, Revelation chapter 12 it says that the dragon persecuted the woman. Here it says that the beast persecuted the saints. This is very important. What is the woman? What is the, it's the church, yes. But what is the, in Revelation 12, the woman is called in Revelation 13 what? The saints. So what is the woman? The saints. Are you understanding me? In other words, it is the faithful church of God. And so it says in verse 7, it was granted to them to make war, to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Remember the waters that the dragon spewed out of his mouth? By the way, whose emissary is the beast? Whose emissary is the little horn? <laughs> Satan's. And that's why God gives us these two chapters, Revelation 12 and 13. Because Revelation 12 shows that the real power behind the persecution of the church is the dragon. But chapter 13 shows us that the dragon persecutes the woman through using what? The beast. In other words, the beast is the emissary of the dragon. Now I want us to go to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 10. Revelation 13 and verse 10. At the end of this period, the year 1798, this beast power, this little horn power was going to receive a deadly wound. It says in verse 10, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. In other words, he's not going to be able to persecute the saints of the Most High anymore. At least for a while. He who kills with the sword must be what? Killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. We've already studied about the sword. What does the sword represent? The sword represents the civil power. Romans chapter 13 is the critical chapter, the verse 9 verses. Do you remember that it is the civil power that bears the sword? And so this power was going to be wounded by the civil power which it had used during its 1260 years of dominion. And let me ask you, when did this happen to the Roman Catholic Papacy? 1798. The power was removed from the Roman Catholic Papacy. It did not cease to exist as a church, but the civil power was removed from it. It could no longer use the governments of the world to accomplish its purposes. And the governments of the world have kept that wound in place till this day. But in the United States of America, slowly but surely, ironically in this country, that wound is being helped to heal by he people who have religious zeal by people who are sincere in their hearts they want to moralize America but they are using the state to accomplish their purposes just like the papacy did during the Middle Ages in other words they are forming an image and a likeness to what that first beast did you know Friedrich Nietzsche the great philosopher once said be careful when you fight the dragon lest you become a dragon and I would say that to Christians all over the world today. Be careful when you fight the dragon of immorality and corruption in society. Beware of the methods you use, lest you in the process also become a dragon. Now, we've moved from the Old Testament to the period of Rome. Rome divided 1260 years. This beast receives a deadly wound at the end of the 1260 years. Do you remember in Revelation chapter 12 it said that the next stage was that the earth helped the woman? And then it says that the dragon is enraged with the woman. So you have two, two key words there. You have the word earth helped the woman. And the second is the earth now, the devil, the dragon, persecutes the woman in its final stage of existence. Earth and woman. Now notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11. Very interesting. Right after this beast receives its deadly wound. Notice what we find in Revelation 13 verse 11. It says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Is that the same earth of Revelation 12? 
Do you know what the only difference is? In Revelation 12, the earth is the territory. In Revelation 13, the beast is the nation that arises in that territory. Are you following me or not? Let me ask you, which was the country in the world that gave refuge to those who were persecuted in Europe? It was the United States. Have you ever heard of the pilgrims? that fled from Europe, from the persecutions in Europe, and came to the United States, and by the way, they then became the persecutors. That's a stage that people don't talk much about. We talk about the constitutional stage of the United States, but we forget that there's the period, the colonial period, when you could be fined and thrown into jail for not going to church on Sunday. Where you could be fined and thrown into jail if you, don't re if you didn't pay your tithes. And I say pay your tithes in this case. Where, where uh, if, if you were not a Christian, you could not occupy an office in the government. Is that the kind of America that you want today? Do you want to return to colonial America? That's what many man ministers want to do. They want to return to colonial America and not to constitutional America. The, the America of the founding fathers, so to speak. And so in Revelation 12, the earth helps the woman. The United States provides refuge for those who are persecuted. Persecution ceases. But Revelation 12 says that then the dragon is enraged because the earth helps the woman. Does Revelation 13 say that after this nation rises from the earth, it will speak like a dragon? It most certainly does. And by the way, listen to this. In Revelation 12, it says that the dragon is enraged against the woman because she keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. Do you know what the devil is going to do? He's going to try and counteract that. He's going to try and counteract the commandments of God by imposing the mark of the beast, which is the same thing as the change in the law in Daniel 7. And he's going to try to counteract the testimony of Jesus, the gift of prophecy, by raising up the second beast, which by the way is called the false prophet. So he's going to raise up a false prophet in Protestantism to try and counteract the true gift of prophecy. So you have a play and counterplay. During the 1260 years the devil says I'm going to use this power to change the law and to change the prophetic times. God says oh yeah at the end of this period I will raise up a people who exalt the law and keep the commandments and they have the testimony of Jesus to set prophecy straight. And the devil says is that right? I'm going to launch a final persecution imposing the mark of the beast and also raising up a false prophet to deceive people about how prophecy will develop. Lead everybody to look to the Middle East. Lead everybody to look to Iraq. While the enemy grows in Rome. And where in the United States, people who are sincere, I'm not, I'm not impugning their motives, they're sincere. Like King Ahasuerus was sincere in the days of Esther. People who don't understand the issues. And think that they need to listen to what the, the religious right in this country wants. And to impose by law their will. I wish I had time, more time to speak about this. We're entering a very dangerous period in the history of the United States. Very dangerous period in the history of this country. So do you see how Revelation 12 and 13 follow the same sequence? Let me ask you, where are we now? The Old Testament has passed, yes? Yeah? When the child was born, passed. Ten divisions of Rome passed. 1260 years passed. The earth helping the woman passed. What is the last stage? The dragon being what? Enraged with the woman, with the remnant of her seed, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So where would God expect, where would we expect God to raise His end time church and when? And what characteristic would it, characteristics would it have? Very simple. The true church has to arise in the United States, the earth. The true church has to arise shortly after 1798, according to the sequence. It has to be a church which teaches that you're supposed to keep all of the commandments of God. And it is a church that has the true prophetic scenario of end time events, as reflected in the book, The Great Controversy. But there are other characteristics which identify this true church. 
Let's go through them quickly. Revelation chapter 14 has God's final message to the world. It's called the three angels message. It's actually one message with three parts. And we're going to go through several characteristics very quickly in Revelation chapter 14 of this end time message. And by the way, this is God's final message to the world. You say, how do we know that it's God's final message? Listen, it's very simple. Because the three angels proclaim their messages in Revelation 14 verses 6 through 12. That's where the three angels messages are found. Immediately afterwards in verse 14, Jesus is seen seated on a cloud and he has a sickle in his hand and he's going to harvest the harvest of the earth and the grapes of the earth. The grapes represents the wicked and the harvest represent the righteous. So in other words the whole world has been, di been divided into two groups by the three angels messages. And so this is God's end time message. Let me ask you, would you expect there to be a church which would proclaim this triple message to the world? Would that be the true church? The church that is proclaiming God's end time message to the world? No doubt whatsoever about it. Notice Revelation 14 and verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Must this be a worldwide church? Must it have a worldwide system in order to proclaim God's message on a global scale? Yes, this can't be some local church somewhere. It can't be some denomination that works in only one little area of the world. It has to be a church which has the capacity to preach the gospel to every nation on planet earth. It must be a worldwide church. Notice verse 7. It says in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God. I wish I had time to refer to that. Fear God means to keep his commandments. In the Old Testament, time and again, as well as in the New, when the expression fear God is used, it is linked with keeping God's law, with keeping God's commandments. So this first angel is saying, fear God, that is keep His commandments. Give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment will come. Thank you, thank you. The hour of His judgment has come or is come. Let me ask you, will the true church teach that we are now living in the judgment? Absolutely. So you have to look for a church who teaches that we are now living in the judgment. The judgment of the righteous. Which God is separating the righteous from the unrighteous because when He comes, He's going to take the righteous to heaven. So He has to separate them first in order to take them home when He comes. The hour of His judgment has come. And by the way, along with the doctrine of the judgment, this church has to teach that the dead are dead. You say, why is this? Well, it's actually very simple. You don't have to be uh, King Solomon to figure it out. If God has celebrates the judgment at a certain point in time, then people didn't go to hell or to heaven when they died. Because if they went to heaven or hell when they died, they already were judged. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So implicit here is the idea that the true church will teach that we are in the judgment and therefore the dead know not anything. And by the way the first angel continues saying and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea and the springs of water. That is a quotation that comes from the fourth commandment of the law of God. This church will call people to keep God's holy Sabbath. They will proclaim it to the world, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Notice the second angel's message, verse 8. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What will the remnant church do? They will call God's people to come out of where? To come out of Babylon. By the way, do you know what Babylon is? Revelation chapter 16, I'll just mention the verse, Revelation 16 and verse 13 says that Babylon has three parts. The dragon, which you've already seen represents Satan, but it represents the political powers of the world that Satan uses. The civil powers joining the religious power. The dragon, the beast, what does the beast represent? We've studied this before. It represents the Roman Catholic papacy, not individual Catholics. Most of God's true people are within the Catholic Church. That does not make the Catholic Church the true church. 
actually during the 1260 years the Roman Catholic Church persecuted are you following me or not it was the persecutor not the persecuted and so I want you to notice here that uh, you have the dragon you have the beast and you have the false prophet what does the false prophet represent it represents apostate Protestantism as it is found primarily where in the United States of America which is going to join the beast to enforce by law what the mark of the beast so is the true church going to call God's true children out of these three powers out of secularism so to speak out of the the papal system out of apostate Protestantism to join God's remnant church absolutely according to Bible prophecy this is exactly what was going to happen and then the third angels message warns about the beast his image and about receiving the mark of the beast if you want to know what the true church is you have to find a church that is talking to you about the beast about the image of the beast and it is talking to you about the mark of the beast and we've already identified the mark of the beast as that mark that the Roman Catholic papacy says that it has and that is that it has changed God's law in their mind at least from Sabbath to Sunday and they say this is the mark of our power because only God could change his holy law and so it has to be a system that warns people a religious uh, organization the church which warns people about these apostate powers and folks I know it is not politically correct to do this but it's not a time for political correctness when people's spiritual lives and eternal destiny is in play we need to speak out not because we hate people we love people in all of these systems and that's why God calls them out incidentally in Revelation chapter 18 verse 4 God says come out of her my people come out of Babylon my people isn't it marvelous that God has people in Babylon would he ever call them out if he didn't have people in Babylon most of his people are in Babylon and let me tell you something Adventists do you know that the Bible teaches that most of those who are in the Adventist church will eventually leave but the Adventist church will not see any decrease because the places of those who left will be taken by those who come in from all of these religious systems to embrace the truth of God so we've noticed several characteristics of the remnant church I'll tell you there's only one church in the world that fits these specifications what are the specifications well let's review them first of all it must be a church of the same stock of the church of all ages it must be built upon the teachings of the apostles and the prophets Old and New Testament it must be in harmony with the true church in all ages number two it must reappear after the fall of the papacy in 1798 number three it must arise where the earth is in the United States of America number four it must keep the commandments of God all of them it must have in its midst the gift of prophecy the spirit of prophecy number six it must be a global worldwide church number seven it must preach that we are now in the hour of God's judgment it must preach God's holy Sabbath are you following me are you starting to catch a picture here it must call God's true children out of these apostate religious systems and it must have as its foundation the pillar of the truth that we find in God's holy word now some people might be wondering Pastor Bohr is it really important that I join a church yes it is let me tell you why in closing go with me to Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 here it's speaking about the harvest of souls that came on the day of Pentecost it says in chapter 2 and verse 41 then those who gladly received his word were baptized what happened with those who received the word they were what 
they were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were what? Were added to them. What does that mean? When they were baptized, 3,000 souls were added to them. Go with me to verse 47. It says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. What does it mean, added to them? It means to be added to the what? It means to be added to the church. And baptism means two things. It means joining Christ, and it also means joining His body, which is the church. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 says that the body of Christ is the church. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, we're told that it's through baptism that we join the body of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful privilege it is to belong to God's remnant church in these last times, to proclaim His message to the world to prepare a people for the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ in power and in glory.